Hi, Mick McQuaid here to talk to you about color. Oh, and I know what you're thinking. Hey, uh, this guy's talking color, but he's in black and white. Uh, Mildred, fix this set. Uh, there's something wrong here. This guy's talking color, but uh, he's, he's not in color. But that's actually the least of our problems. If I were in color, the colors that I perceive would differ from the colors that you perceive. So let me give you an example. Take this um, switch receptacle. I see it as blue, but if this were in color, you would see a different color blue than I see, because our, our pictures of, of blue are mediated by my camera, by um, the nonlinear editing software in my computer, uh, by YouTube when I upload it and, and it compresses it, by your computer when you download it and view it on your monitor, and your eyes, which differ even from mine. So it's difficult to see and use and communicate about color. This is a project that has occupied many people over the years, and one in particular has been very successful at it, and that person is Josef Albers. So the remainder of this video is dedicated to discussing Albers. First, there's a part discussing his career and environment, so you get an idea of the situation. And then the second part is four exercises from his project, which he named Interaction of Color. Now I'd like to talk about Josef Albers' career and uh, environment and give you an idea about the situation in which he uh, flourished. And um, this will help you understand a little bit about uh, his influence and the things that influenced him. So he lived from the, from the 1880s to the 1970s, and he started his real uh, artistic career at the Bauhaus in 1921, I think, 1920 or 1921, as a student and then after a year or two became a professor uh, at the Bauhaus. Now the Bauhaus, whose logo I'm showing on the screen here, was a hotbed of artistic activity and scientific activity as well, uh, although that's less known. Um, many prominent artists uh, worked at the Bauhaus, in, including, the, of course, the founder of the Bauhaus, Walter Gropius, whose biography I'm showing here, um, Paul Clay, a, uh, uh, who was a fellow teacher with Albers. They co-taught a crafts class together. Uh, and I'm showing a picture of uh, a famous Paul Clay painting on the screen. And Vasily Kandinsky was another one who was uh, a fam famous uh, artist at the Bauhaus. I'm showing uh, a, a famous painting of his, a fa favorite painting of mine called Several Circles, uh, a famous painting of Kandinsky's. Um, and in addition to the artists at the Bauhaus, they entertained many visitors who gave guest lectures, including a lot of scientists. So Max Wertheimer, uh, prominent among the Gestalt psychologists, uh, lectured there and imparted the Gestalt principles, which I'm showing a poster of, on uh, a contemporary poster that I just found on the web uh, of uh, depicting some of the Gestalt principles. So they had this tremendous hotbed of activity, of intellectual activity, that um, influenced them uh, and um, strengthened them as artists. And then, of course, the Nazis uh, came along, and the Bauhaus was dissolved under pressure from the Nazis, and the um, members of the Bauhaus fled to all different countries around the world. And this in greatly enhanced the reach and influence of the Bauhaus and made it one of the most uh, enduring artistic movements of the 20th century because all these artists took the ideas they had created at the Bauhaus to all different countries. Now, Albers fled to the United States, and there the architect, um, Philip Johnson, who is pictured here with a model of his uh, AT&T building, which is in Manhattan, um, Philip Johnson arranged for um, Albers to get a job at uh, Black Mountain College teaching. And Black Mountain College was kind of like a mini Bauhaus in the sense that, that a lot of influential artists worked there and rubbed shoulders, and so he met uh, John Cage there, the composer, uh, John Cage's partner, Merce Cunningham, the choreographer. Um, Robert Rauschenberg was a student of Albers's there. Here's a, a, a picture of a fragment of one of Rauschenberg's uh, works that sold for like $50 million. That reminds me, Albers's own works have sold sometimes for over a million dollars a piece. Um, and then the poet Charles Olson, who is pictured here uh, at the blackboard, so all these famous artists um, lived and worked together and influenced each other, and then 
went their separate ways. The, the uh, Black Mountain College dissolved in the uh, 1950s under financial pressure, and all these artists spread to, to uh, different parts of the country or the world and took their influences with them. So here again was a, a kind of flowering of artistic influences that Albers participated in. Albers himself went to Yale in, in 1950 and um, became the head of design there and spent eight years there as the head of design, following which he retired and became a fellow at Yale. And it was during this period that he uh, published his project, Interaction of Color, in 1963. And this project was a initially a boxed set of uh, color plates on, like, uh, cardboard or thick uh, paper and a book. And um, I was lucky enough to see a, one of these box sets once in the 1980s. Uh, it was selling for well over $200 at the time, which was too much money for me. I didn't buy it, but I, I examined it. And um, I satisfied myself with the paperback edition of the book, which, it, which you can get for a couple of dollars on ABE books today. There are a couple of editions of the book. I recommend the 50th anniversary edition if you can find it. That's um, got better color fidelity, I think, than the earlier um, copies. Um, so yeah, Interaction of Color then on its 50th anniversary was converted into an iPad app. And you might um, wish that it were an Android app. Some people complain, why isn't it an Android app? Android is cheaper than iPad. We want an Android app. Well, tough. Uh, Android has better color fidelity than Android. Uh, in fact, an uh, iPad has better color fidelity than your computer monitor, most likely. Uh, only the most expensive monitors rival the iPad in terms of color reproduction. Now, I'm going to show you some uh, of the plates from the iPad app, and it's a little embarrassing because you won't see exactly the right colors. You won't see exactly what I intend you to see uh, because of the mediation that I mentioned earlier. And in fact, if you go to YouTube uh, and uh, search for uh, Joseph Albers or Interaction of Color, you'll see quite a number of interesting videos. In fact, one in particular, I recommend the op art one that I'm showing on the screen now. Uh, but there's one video in particular I want to draw your attention to, and it's a lecture about interaction of color in which the woman who's lecturing uses the iPad app. So she plugs her iPad into the projector and shows it on the screen behind her. And she describes the colors, and it's kind of hilarious when she, she says that, you know, this uh, color being shown is purple, and in fact it looks brown to us because of the mediation of, you know, the, the projector she's showing it on and the camera that's recording her lecture, and then the... Um, compression of YouTube, and then your monitor, or at least my monitor, shows uh, it, it, brown and purple are indistinguishable from each other after all this mediation. So it sort of clearly illustrates the uh, problem of viewing and using and communicating about color that, uh, that Albers is tackling. Uh, now there's one last thing I'd like to talk about before the exercises, which is Pantone. So the Pantone Corporation publishes the Pantone matching system, which is very widely used by, de by designers. Uh, to uh, specify colors. And it's an interesting example of the problem of agreeing on anything in the world of color because if you look up Wikipedia, uh, the Wikipedia entry on Pantone, it says that uh, Pantone has about a thousand spot colors. And if you go on Pantone's website, uh, they have uh, many pages on their website. On one of them it says they have almost 2,000 spot colors. On another page on Pantone's website, it says they have over 2,000 spot colors. So it's difficult to uh, keep things up to date and difficult to agree on anything in the world of color. And this is just yet another illustration of that uh, fact. So now I would like to turn uh, my attention to the exercises in interaction of color. So now on to interaction of color, Albert's uh, color education project, and the exercises within. And there are lots of different exercises in interaction of color. Uh, I'm just going to explore a few of them with you. And um, some of them are, some of them concern a triangle of uh, primary colors and secondary colors. Um, others are just exercises that you can do with strips of paper. And uh, this upcoming exercise is an exercise in after images. So I want you to stare intently at the black dot in the center of the red circle. And I want you to not waver your gaze at all. Just keep staring intently for 15 or 20 seconds. And I'm going to time this because uh, if you pause the video, sometimes YouTube puts a logo over it. So I want you to just leave the video running and just stare intently at the uh, black dot in the center of the red circle.
I'll just keep the video running. And then I'm going to change the picture. And I want you to keep staring at the black dot. Now it's against a white background. And I want you to see if, in staring intently at it, you see uh, the color cyan, um, which is a kind of light blue. And if you see a, uh, some crescent moon shapes, um, cyan is the complement of red. And so what I expect you to see is uh, an after image of the complementary color to the uh, background color that you saw initially. So this is an exercise in after images. Um, and it sort of illustrates for you um, what happens if you have a colored ground um, and, and someone looks away from that colored ground after a while. Now, before we uh, do the next exercise, I just want to mention that um, not everybody sees things the same way. So, you know, I told you that you should see an after image of cyan, which is kind of a bluish, maybe a bluish greenish color after the uh, uh, image of its complement red. But not everyone sees that, and not everyone will see what I'm going to suggest that you'll see in this next exercise. So stare at the two little brown squares and see whether you see them as different in this picture. What most people see is that the upper square is lighter than the lower square. And then um, as the, as after you've stared at this for a while, Alvarez removes the intervening strips of uh, dark blue and yellow and reveals that it's all one strip behind it, that it appears different because it, it's on different grounds. So you can influence people's perception of color uh, by putting a, a color against one color against a different background. And that's the theme also of the next uh, couple of exercises that we're going to look at. All right then, for the for third exercise, I would like you to stare at these two X's. And I particularly would like you to see if you see the uh, that the top X is uh, a slightly different color from the bottom X. But then when you look closely at the uh, uh, bottom right corner of the top X, you'll see that it connects directly to the other X and that they are in fact the same color. But being on different grounds, they do appear to be different colors. And now the fourth exercise is um, similar. Uh, take a look at the two uh, small squares in the center, the upper center and lower center square, and see if, you, if they seem to be the same or similar colors. They're not, of course. If you look at the small squares on the left, you'll see the, um, the squares as they're supposed to appear. I mean, the squares as they do appear uh, together. Um, the, the upper square on the left matches the upper square in the center. The lower square on the left matches the lower square in the center. And when you see them side by side, the differences are, are extreme. But if you just gaze at the center with its uh, grounding, um, they look very similar or even the same. So these are just four uh, exercises to sharpen your sense of color. And I would like you to uh, do more such exercises. And um, I think it's important. And I, I want to relate a story from my past. I had a, a situation where we had to produce slideshows and uh, we had to print out the slideshows to put in a briefing book uh, for the, the consumers of the slideshows. And something went wrong with the printer such that our slideshows as they appeared on the screen differed quite dramatically from the colors in the uh, briefing book. And I brought this up to my coworker, and he said, who cares? It doesn't matter. The, you know, the, these colors, they're different, but they're fine. Who, who cares that they're, they're not the same? And I, I think you should care. I think it does matter. Uh, as an example, the uh, Pantone Corporation sponsors a Color of the Year contest every year. And in the commentary on their website about that contest, they talk about the feelings that the colors uh, excite in the judges who choose the Color of the Year. That passion is something that you should experience. And I think that by sharpening your color sense, you can ignite and inflame that passion. And that's important. And you don't need the iPad app to do that. So I recommend this iPad app, but if you can't afford that or you don't have time to uh, to get it, you certainly can get a copy of Vogue magazine or some other glossy fashion magazine that has big swatches of vivid color in its pages and get a pair of scissors and cut out the strips of paper and just experiment, just play with it. That's what Albers did. He didn't have an iPad app. He just took strips of paper and compared them to each other and it sharpened his eye and it can sharpen yours too. And that is really the centerpiece of color education. Not all the terminology in the world is not going to help you be a better designer if you don't have a sharpened uh, color sense. And so um, that's what I urge you to do. That's, that's my takeaway from this lecture, is uh, 
get some scissors and colored paper and uh, start looking. So thank you very much for your attention, and I look forward to speaking to you again.